I'm Mark Baker, I'm the director of the Australian Centre for Jewish Civilization, where we run various programs, and one of the programs that we run is a program in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. And we felt that it was important in order to um, really understand the purpose of this program to run an annual oration that was dedicated to the memory of a particular individual that, who represents something very fundamental to how I believe the theme of Holocaust and genocide should be remembered. And so tonight, the Wallenberg Oration is about remembering in a particular context, in an academic context, where we look back at the past and try to understand what it means for the future. And Raoul Wallenberg, perhaps, is a fitting person to commemorate in this context, because he, as everyone I assume here knows, was a Swedish diplomat who came to Budapest and saved the lives of so many Hungarian Jews. He risked his own life by standing in the path of bullets and saving who knows how many Jews. There are some people who, are, who were rescued by Wallenberg who claim that he might be responsible for close to 100,000 Jews who have survived. And he represents what Yehuda Bauer, one of the most foremost historians of the Holocaust and genocide, said is the sole purpose for teaching the Holocaust. That if all we tell is a story in genocide of death and darkness and destruction, then what do we remember and what can we learn? But it's through the acts of incredible heroism, through the acts of incredible altruism, of people like Raoul Wallenberg, of people like Irina Sendler in Poland, of people like Paul Rosasabagina in Rwanda, who saved people in the Hotel Milk Colin there in Kigali, that they remind us of the responsibilities of what it means to be a human being faced with these forces of destruction. Which brings me to our distinguished visitor who is here, Professor Omer, Bartov, and Omer Bartov is a distinguished, it's in the title, Professor of European History and Professor of History and Professor of German Studies um, in, um, at Brown University in Boston. He's considered one of the world's leading authorities on the subjects of genocide. He's the author of seven books and the editor of three other volumes, and his work has been translated into several languages. His most recent book, Erased, Vanishing Traces of Jewish Galicia in Present-Day Ukraine, examines the politics of memory in Western Ukraine, and we were privileged to hear you give a research seminar um, to our department um, yesterday. Um, Professor Bartov has written other books, and just to name some, The Eastern Front, 1941-45, to 45, a book on Hitler's army, a book entitled Murder in Our Midst, Mirrors of Destruction, Germany's War and the Holocaust, and in um, Professor Bartov's interest in representation has written a book called The Jew in Cinema and is currently working on a new book um, called Blood Brothers Puchach, the biography of a town, examining the theme of interethnic violence. So it's an incredible honour to have Professor Bartov address us on this inaugural Wallenberg oration and I'm very pleased to invite you and to welcome you on behalf of Monash University. Thank you. I will talk today about a complex topic, which is the relationship between the Holocaust and genocide, a topic which would appear to many of us as obvious. There is such a relationship. What I will try to show in the next 50 minutes or so is that the relationship is more complex than meets the eye, and is still one that is being contested uh, by many on a variety of grounds. I'll start by talking about what I call the discovery and rediscovery of genocide. The idea that the Holocaust may have been a leitmotif or a main event of the 20th century only emerged toward the end of the century, long after the belated appearance of the term genocide, introduced as an internationally recognized term in 1948 by the Genocide Convention, genocide was meant to connote the mass and indiscriminate killing of specifically targeted populations, 
an increasingly widespread phenomenon that had hitherto lacked a precise definition. The Holocaust was seen as one of the most distinctive manifestations of genocide. Why then has the assertion of the Holocaust centrality to the history of the 20th century come so many years after the event? Does this assertion merely reflect the zeitgeist of the current end of this century? Or does it accurately recognize the profound consequences of an event that former generations had failed to perceive? Clearly, even now, the view of the genocide of the Jews as being at the intersection of the main trends of modern history and civilization has not gone unchallenged. Indeed, a growing chorus of critics claim that what they perceive as the overemphasis on the Holocaust in current historical discourse distorts our view of the past, relegates other atrocities to a secondary position, obscures the crimes of imperialism and post-colonialism in the third world, and privileges the Jews over the rest of suffering humanity. Such criticisms are obviously rela related to the fact that for several decades after the end of World War II, the mass murder of the Jews, which came to be generally known as the Holocaust only gradually between the 1960s and 1980s, hardly featured even as a crucial event in the history of the war itself, let alone that of the entire century. The new focus on the Holocaust seems to displace other historical protagonists and to empower the Jews, who despite their mass extermination are still suspected by some of seeking to legitimize their growing influence and power by appeals to their past persecution. To be sure, the absence of the Holocaust from the general rather than the Jewish post-war historical consciousness was arguably the product of anti-Semitic prejudice, repression of collaboration in mass murder, and nationalist and communist political ideologies. But if these influences have been largely overcome, contemporary critics of the alleged omnipresence of the Holocaust in public discourse attribute this phenomenon to prejudice against the third world, repression of complicity in the suffering of non-European peoples, and capitalist and neo-colonialist political ideologies that perpetuate such crimes even as they deny their existence. The growing influence of forces that oppose the recent view of the Holocaust as an historical event of universal significance compels us to examine in more detail some of the specific aspects of this argument. Was the Holocaust, as some have argued, a break of civilization or an extreme manifestation of trends and fractures that are still present today? What is the relationship between those who assert the Holocaust centrality and those who reject it? Can we identify some continuity in both sets of arguments and can both claim a degree of legitimacy? Does the discovery of an event centrality long after it receded into history reflect a better understanding and a more objective view of the past or is it a mere phase, or even fad, that will be replaced by the discovery of other historical events and actors who will make their own claims for a central locus in the past? The discovery of the Holocaust, I say the discovery, of course, I mean that it became an important event uh, long after it actually happened. The discovery of the Holocaust is, in fact, closely linked to the, to the discovery of genocide. When Raphael Lemkin, Raphael Lemkin was a Polish Jewish lawyer uh, who um, uh, fled from Poland 
uh, following the German occupation, and ended up in America and uh, coined the term genocide and fought for making that uh, into a universally accepted term by the UN uh, genocide resolution of 1948. <coughs> so when Lenkin coined the term that was eventually embraced by the UN, he was thinking first and foremost of the Holocaust, although he certainly considered many other cases as worthy, so to speak, of the term. Indeed, while the memory of the event was fresh on everyone's minds, and the horrifying documentary footage was available for all to see, even if they had not had any direct contact with the atrocity, the absence of an appropriate term to describe that particular crime against humanity became glaringly clear during the Nuremberg Tribunal. In convening the first international court ever assembled to provide a judicial setting for indicting and punishing an entirely new class of criminals who had perpetrated an as yet nameless crime, it became evident that the new concept or that a new concept had to be introduced both into legal discourse and into international relations, that is, the concept of genocide. Still, although it served as an incentive for coining the term genocide, the Holocaust itself was not generally recognized as a crucial event in the 20th century for several more decades. I can just cite, there, there are many examples to be cited, but if you look at books that were written in the 1950s, 60s, even 70s, if you look up in the index, books on World War II, uh, books on the Third Reich, on Nazi Germany, if you look in the index, Holocaust, uh, extermination of Jews, persecution of Jews, you won't find any. It was not part of the general historiography of the time. It was not taught at universities such as uh, say Oxford University, to which I went at the beginning of the 1980s, if you wanted to study the Holocaust, you had to go to Jewish studies. It was not taught in the history department. And we tend to forget all of that because now things have changed. Moreover, despite the clear relationship between the term genocide and a, as a general category and the event of the Holocaust as a specific instance of genocide, a certain competition developed between the two that can hardly be said to have diminished in recent scholarly, media, and political discourse. Paradoxically, the centrality of genocide was not recognized both because it was used too loosely to denounce the actions of one's opponents, whether they merited the term or not, and because it was so prevalent as to become almost invisible. That is, genocide kept happening after 45 over and over again. The Cold War contributed greatly both to the perpetuation of the phenomenon of genocide and to the long-term refusal to recognize its pervasiveness. So this curious condition where a phenomenon that has just been identified, defined, and named a name both kept happening and remained unseen had also to do with the fact that the victims of genocide were often voiceless. Western intellectual and scholarly debates were concerned with other issues, such as the ideological split between capitalism and communism, the degree to which either of them could be described as fascist, and the conflicts, promises, and disillusions of decolonization and liberation. The generally triumphal tone of these debates, the certainty that one was right and the other side was wrong, or absolutely wrong, left little room for the actual victims of genocide and other related crimes against humanity in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. In the case of the Holocaust, the vast majority of the victims were, of course, as we know, dead. Many of the survivors were rendered voiceless in a number of ways. Some could simply not express their trauma. Others found that the societies 
to which they transplanted themselves or to which they returned did not want to hear about their experiences in any detail or when they did wanted to hear it expressed in a manner that validated their own identities and interpretations of the event rather than doing justice to the memories of the survivors. The urge to reintegrate into old societies or to be accepted into the new host countries played a role in muting the victims either temporarily or permanently. And the nature of the atrocity itself was such that it was both exceedingly difficult to represent and almost impossible to believe. The reappearance of both genocide and the Holocaust, including the emergence of competition between the two as, central, as a central phenomenon of the past century, was also related to changing political and ideological realities toward the end of the century. While the Arab-Israeli War of 1967 played an important role in Jewish consciousness and in changing conceptions and representations of the Holocaust, the global East-West conflict and the mass killings it generated <coughs> in such countries as Vietnam and Cambodia drove home the realization that despite all the vows made at the end of World War II of never again, the phenomenon of crimes against humanity had hardly been banished from the face of the earth. But it was the end of the Cold War, the collapse of communism, and the accompanying eruption of new ethnic and religious conflicts associated with long repressed enemies, enmities and prejudices that compelled people to look back at the legacy of the entire century and to reevaluate the optimistic prophecies made at the end of World War II. Yet just as genocide and the Holocaust were, so to speak, liberated from the straitjacket of the Cold War, they were plunged into the realities of the new turn of the century. In some ways, it now became possible to debate more openly what had previously been obscured by ideological constraints. It was also possible to view documents and visit archives that had previously been under lock and key. In other respects, however, while the focus on past genocides might have provided a context and an explanation for present atrocities, it also diverted attention from the crimes that could still be stopped by dwelling on crimes that could no longer be undone. In a sense, the obsession with the phenomenon of genocide came simultaneously with the proliferation of actual genocide. Talking about past genocide eased the consciences of those who could not bring themselves to engage in combating the mass crimes that were about to happen or were already unfolding right under their very nose or on their television screens. Thus, between the opening of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. in 1993 and the establishment of the Task Force for International Cooperation on Holocaust Education, <coughs> Remembrance and Research in Stockholm in 1998, hundreds of thousands of Bosnians and Rwandans were murdered, at least a million. Outside intervention came either very belatedly, as in Bosnia, or not at all, as in Rwanda. The rediscovery of genocide and the Holocaust also brought back to mind some links that the previous decades had refused to acknowledge. Already in 1951, in a famous book called The Origins of Totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt, who was a Jewish German intellectual who fled from Germany and ended up in the United States in the 1930s, claimed that one of the origins of totalitarianism was European imperialism. This aspect of her influential book was not picked up by Western scholars during the decades of post-war colonialism and decolonization. It was finally recognized, although it's still uh, under research, 
only in recent years. The links are not only historical, in the sense that there was a clear, if crooked, path between European policies of repression, ethnic cleansing and genocide, enslavement and exploitation, especially in the African colonies, and consequent and subsequent such policies in, um, uh, carried out in Europe itself. One can also trace the origins of such recent African genocides as the case of Rwanda to pre-World War I colonialism and its interwar and post-war <coughs> manifestations. Similarly, the multi-ethnic roots of European genocide have only recently been recognized. With the collapse of the German, Austro-Hungarian, Russian, and Ottoman empires in World War I, the various religious and ethnic groups that inhabited that vast area of borderland stretching from the Baltic to the Balkans began seeking national self-determination. This was, of course, also President Wilson's 14 points. The nationalization of ethnicity and religion, which began in this region in the latter part of the 19th century, resulted even before 1914 in a great deal of violence during the liberation of the Balkans from Ottoman rule and culminated in large-scale ethnic cleansing and genocide throughout the first half of the 20th century. This is very much the context in which the Holocaust itself happened. To take just one example, the composition, indeed even the location of Poland and Ukraine changed dramatically between 1914 and the aftermath of World War II. While the Jews living in those countries were mostly murdered, the Ukrainians and the Poles carried out mutual ethnic cleansing subjected to a brutal German occupation regime that had planned to depopulate and colonize much of this area, once the Reich, the, the, the German Reich, had retreated from the region, these populations also cleansed the ethnic Germans in their midst. Meanwhile, international agreements moved Poland westward into former territories of the German Reich, while establishing Ukrainian and Belarusian Soviet republics in areas formerly under the rule of interwar Poland. So the map both geographically, politically, and demographically changed dramatically. Recent research has rediscovered such population policies as being at the root of much of the last century's violence. A number of scholars have argued <coughs> that there were clear links between the demographic policies of Nazi Germany and the final solution, while others have maintained that Soviet population policies, which included categorization of nationalities and stigmatization of state enemies, similarly culminated in mass incarceration in gulags, vast ethnic cleansing operations, and possibly also genocide. Indeed, it has been suggested that the entire apparatus of the emerging modern nation state, racial state, or totalitarian state, became dedicated to the process of defining enemies and targeting victims. Under circumstances of total war, especially when conducted by ruthless dictatorial regimes, driven by rigid ideological dogmas, this process unleashed unprecedented state-directed violence. So this is the first context that I wanted to talk about, this relationship between genocide and the Holocaust.